excuse me. <clears throat> uh, sometimes the infrastructure function is overwhelmed and it floods the surrounding neighborhoods to the north and east of the park with the rainwater. This is a very serious problem because the water that rolls off the roofs from everywhere in the watershed, it picks up pesticides, it goes in the yards, picks up pesticides, fertilizers, pet waste, viruses and bacteria that come with that, and then it goes over the gutters and picks up all of the toxic waste from our cars, from the streets, the oil leak, the other fluid leaks, the brake pad dust, the tire dust, and then it drains into the pond and then it's in the neighborhood when it floods. So, floods like this don't just mean water damage to these, this neighborhood. They're serious contamination and health threats to the health of our community. We've had two of these floods, by the way, in the last 20 years. One was 1995, the other was 2000. So the res residents are obviously quite concerned by the school board's dis their plan to decrease even more permeable land <coughs> in this important stream storm water basin. The relocation of the middle school 17 years ago resulted in three to four acres of permeable land loss. That means that this area that used to be grass and absorb water and hold it, now just runs right into the pond. So this, by the way, is not the final plan. This was the June 3rd that we thought would be final. Um, but this eight, I had to talk. I'll go this way. <laughs> so um, this is 28,000 square feet. This is their 750 seat theater and um, multi-purpose room. Uh, so that's over a half an acre of permeable land loss, permeable land loss right there. And also the red trees that are popping up everywhere, those were in the way of construction, moving the fields around. So those would have all had to be ripped out. And those are also, trees are an integral part of the stormwater basin because they have deep roots and they hold a lot of water. So that's a big concern. Of course, park users were concerned about losing this flaccid, flat, grassy play area and the workout station. This area of the park is the only area where people can really kick a ball instead of a volleyball court uh, play because everything else is really slanted. Uh, so this is the most heavily used for family picnics and games. <laughs> when uh, the school board let us know that they had made some revisions to the final plan, which makes it less intrusive into the park. Um, they took 6,000 square feet off of the Performing Arts Center, although it's 22,000 square feet now, which still seems really large. Uh, and some, some of people wonder if we really need it that large, but it would save some of these trees by being that small, which was really its important habitat. We're concerned, though, that, of course, the construction of this big building may not actually end up saving the trees after all, because it's pretty close. While the right size pool is still to be determined, um, should the community support a new pool, then Friends of Polywog assert that a pool size to attract regional competitions, like the Olympic size that was first proposed, would create a serious negative impact to the park and its neighbors. This is a drawing of a pool that was funded uh, to be built in El Segundo, between El Segundo and Weisburn Olympic Pool Stadium. And just to get an idea of the, the the size of events that are expected at Olympic sized pools, they're planning on 900 spectator seats and 500 athlete seats. And that doesn't include, of course, there's the capacity of people in the pool, 250 or so. So it brings a lot of people and a lot of teams. Um, dozens of teams usually compete at Olympic pools at the same time, which means frequent announcements on PA systems. Um, Sometimes they use PA systems now at Bay Pool and 
they really, the sound saturates the whole park. Not only that, but several blocks into the neighborhoods. So the thought of having those impact the park and neighborhood like that is, is uh, just something we don't think should be there. Um, the purpose of those Olympics pool, pools are usually for huge events, and we think they need an appropriate commercial zone, not a neighborhood park. Just within the past year, Holly Walk has come under siege from a variety of proposals. In the past year, the plans have included this bicycle path going right through the flat grassy area, um, a skateboard park, a heritage square, and the Olympic pool, new parking lot, and the auditorium were in this location in the school board's first plan. If these proposals had gone through, there wouldn't be much of a park left. Some people see this green space as wasted space. But in addition to its underlying function as a stormwater retention basin, Hollywood is already hard pressed into service for our community. You can see all it does for our community on this list. But even when it's empty of humans, its ecosystems are teeming with wildlife, contributing to our planet. We need to be smart about this space. It's not a blank slate waiting for change. It's valuable green space just as it is. The city of Los Angeles now recognizes its mistakes of, the, of their past and is spending over a billion dollars to remove 11 miles of concrete that they poured decades ago to constrain the LA River. They say that the main purpose of the costly removal of all that concrete is to restore the river's natural marshy environment so it can improve the quality of life in their city by creating more open green space and habitat, wildlife habitat. We hope that the school district which owns this land has leadership that will do more environmental impact studies as they implement any new plans. And you can help us Save Polywog Park by sharing this information you've learned tonight with your friends, neighbors, family, and commit to leaving this park a nature park for future generations to enjoy it. Thank you. to turn over the presentation. Uh, in the meantime, if I could just ask anybody that hasn't signed in to identify themselves, and um, Aaron should be able to get you signed in. Uh, we do have two sign-in sheets, if you were wondering. So the first sign-in sheet is for the Residents Association, so that we can keep you apprised of upcoming community meetings. The second one is the school board is trying to compile information on people, not unlike myself, who aren't on their list. Um, so perhaps if you don't have children that are currently in the school district, wouldn't be on their list, so I encourage you to sign up to get uh, the latest information from them on their plans. Thank you. Thank you. Um, as said before, I'm Ellen Rosenberg. I'm on the uh, Manhattan Beach Unified School District Board, and I'm in my, my second term on the board. I've had um, I have three kids in our schools, two of which have graduated, and uh, I'm happy to be here tonight. And I want to thank all of you for being here tonight, for MBRA for making it happen, for FOP for, for their shepherding the park, and, um, and also making this so well happen. And um, thank you so much for, for caring. This is more than we get at a board meeting, so it's pretty exciting. Yeah, it's fun. Yes. Um, uh, we've introduced the members from our team, from the district itself, and from our consultant DLR, uh, and we are, have been working with them for the last six months on a facilities master plan. Um, we're going to be quick because we have 10 minutes, but we have plenty of time for Q&A so we can build on further when that comes. So if it seems like I'm rushing a bit, it's just to try to, to fit into that, that timing. Um, on a very high level, um, first of all, I recognize that the, the topic of this meeting is focused very much on the middle school in Hollywood. But I, what I do want to clarify is that we have been going through a six month long facilities master plan that addresses the, the entire district, all eight of our, our school sites, uh, in addition to some our non school sites like the maintenance and operations yard. So, this is um, you know, what we're talking about tonight regarding uh, the middle school in Polywog, it's just one component of an overall project. 
the purpose of really is just to have an informed approach to how we manage our facilities, um, how we address, you know, taking good care of them because a, a positive environment is important to the, the learning experience, and um, how we plan for the future again in, in an educated manner. So that is the purpose today. And education is always evolving, and the ways in which we deliver education. Um, to the students is evolving, and in some cases that calls for, for changes in what a classroom or a school building, building looks like and other forces that come to bear on it, technology, um, and, and other uh, theories in education. So that is part of the change as well, because we don't want to just keep up, we want to exceed what's happening in education in our schools. It's a lot of what drives the success of our community. And um, so that's why uh, it's important to us to, to understand what's going on with all of, all of our facilities. Um, with that, I know this is a bit of a busy slide, but it's just a little bit of history because I think, I know I forget some of these things sometimes and not everyone, I mean, most of them have been in this neighborhood all of their lives, but we're talking about our, our different school sites. The, the preschool, which was built in 53, as you'll see here, um, is just uh, west of the park and at one time I believe it was part of a, an original middle school site. Um, during one of our renovation periods, we used it as a transition site. Um, it's had some levels of modernization and um, you know, has almost 400 students. It's a very um, popular you know, aspect of our, of our community. Um, Grandview Elementary, which also is coupled with Ladera, Grandview up on the hill, excuse me, Ladera down below, um, you know, the, the, the longest in place at 1939. Is someone shaking their head back there? Is there a oh, you can't hear me. Oh, thank you. Is that better? Yes. I'm doing it. Thank you. I'm letting you know that. I thought you were disagreeing with the year, so no. Um, as well as Ladera, um, which has um, the grand portion of that campus has been through uh, some modernization. Um, Ladera less so. And then we have Meadows Elementary School. And you know, I won't go through all of it here, but you can just see the, the ages, the attendance levels, and uh, where we are uh, with all of our schools. Most of them, with the exception of the middle school, are you know, built in the 30s, 40s, and 50s. Um, so it may be a little surprising of why is the middle school even coming up, because it is our youngest site. Um, and that's, that's a reasonable question. You can see there, just by the addition of relocatables, um, we had a growth in population. That school was scaled for about 1,100 students, and we are you know, over 1,500. So that's driving part of this. And, um, and we also use facilities across Hollywood Park at the pool and other areas that are not adjacent to but part of our campus use. Um, so the next two slides, we, uh, Delinka Group is uh, with some of the DLR retained to do enrollment projection studies. Um, this first slide you'll see basically just covers you know, 2001 to 2015, so that, that you know, up until today. And this is just to make a point that there, like anything, there are cycles. We have cycles in attendance. And you'll see we go from about you know, 6,300 to almost 6,900 um, students in the cycle that, that has, is just ending in this observation in 2015. Things cycle up, things cycle down. You can think of it as a you know, sideways escort. And um, so we are definitely you know, experiencing a, a high point in coming, in coming off of that. Um, Delinka was uh, asked to project out 10 years. That's what the next slide will show you. And um, like any cycle, there's cycles up and cycles down. It does show some moderate taking off. You'll see it ending up in 2025 at 6,500 students. Um, we by no means think that's going to continue on a downward trend. Um, and, but yeah, we do you know, acknowledge that things go up and things go down. And I think what's most important, particularly when it comes to the middle school, as you'll see by the, the gray band in the middle, that you know, going from 1500 to about you know 1350, we, we still are well over what again what it was scaled for, which was um, about 1100 students. Um, and then obviously there's information about the elementary and the high school as well. Um, the next few slides are really just to you know to illustrate that we did ask a lot, have a lot of um, site-specific, parent-specific, as-specific, pardon me, and community-specific input in this effort that's taken in place the last six months. But we definitely uh, recognize that we want to do more interaction with the non-parent population. One of the reasons that we're asking you to sign up for now, um, we don't have electronic access to folks outside of the district, and it's very costly to do mailings in addition to not you know, particularly environmentally sensitive. So, 
Hey, we encourage you to sign up. We'd be happy to share what's going on. We've had some feedback. You know, oh, I didn't know this was happening, or you know, why, you know, why haven't I heard about this? And it's just, it's hard to, to reach everybody all the, all the time outside of our immediate parent base that we have access to very readily. So we want to do a better job of that, and another reason why we're happy to see you here tonight. But this just illustrates, excuse me, some of the different, you know, different meetings that were held, different sessions that were held, um, a variety of different topics. Excuse me, I'm going to grab a water. And then um, these show the number of campus and community-related uh, meetings. The, uh, the Turtle is our preschool, <laughs> the, Grand, uh, the Grand Vigator, the Meadows Mustangs, the Pacific Panzer, Panthers, the Pennant Count Dragons, the Robinson um, Riptides, and the Middle School and the High School. These were the, the meetings that took place specifically with those groups uh, that happened as well. And about almost, you know, a little over 900 people were involved in the process that has taken place over the over the last six months. Uh, towards gathering the information about what the community, uh, the student community, the parent community, the outside community, you know, things we need and things we want for the district. In addition to the the hard information about you know what are the actual facility needs based on wear, tear, and, and keeping them in, in viable condition. Um, I'd like to uh, invite up uh, Kevin Fleming with DLR. DLR is uh, the um, is an architectural firm. Uh, Kevin is, and actually Virginia Marquardt, who is here as well today, are from their you know, K twelve division of that organization, and um, they have worked very hard uh, throughout the last six months with us, guiding yeah, us through the process of gathering information, of uh, engaging with uh, other other organizations that assess the facilities and that um, helped us design what our goals were, what our uh, methodologies were going about this. Um, Kevin is an architect, and sometimes when people hear the word architect, they think things are final. Um, some of the diagrams and the designs that you're going to see are, are very, very preliminary, and that's kind of a key message that I want to put out. This is, we are so early in this process. Um, the fact that we have designs, very preliminary designs, ideas for our eight school sites just means that we have ideas. By all means, not all of that is necessarily going to happen, and it will be very much a collaborative, mutual effort to decide what does happen, what will be the next steps, what is the, the community interested in, in having there. So um, we're, we're, all, we're all in this together, and again, it makes me very happy to see so many people interested at such an early stage of the game. Um, one um, disclaimer there, we may not have the answers to every single question tonight because this is so preliminary, but um, again, we're very happy to have this interaction. So with that, thank you, Kevin. What is this going to tell you? So everybody knows this is my thesis project when I graduated. <laughs> so what I want to run through is we did a master plan with all of the input from the community and the students and the faculty and the and the administration for each one of the campus. So I'm not going to explain them, but I want everybody to kind of see and be aware <clears throat> of what the master plans look like because they took into consideration not only the existing facility conditions, but how do we make the campuses more effective, more safe for the students for drop off or pick up or um, fencing. And then every one of these schools share their play fields and everything else with the community. So in, in a certain sense, they're all like little parks for the neighborhoods and the community. So we wanted to make sure that we address each one of those issues as we went through that. So the first one I'm going to go through is just the preschool, and this is obviously in contingent with Polywalk Park. So these are all divided up. Each one of the arrows, if anybody's aware of the, the district website, has the master plan pointed. Every one of those has a cost associated with it, because the whole point was to develop the vision and then understand what the parameters of that vision was. And that, that's this step, that's all we did. Kevin, I'm, I'm sorry to interrupt, but can you just indicate what streets are where? Because all we're seeing is a big <clears throat> block, but can you just say, like, this is Pepper, this is Heron, this is, I mean, just something so we know where we are? Okay, I mean, for a lot of those, you'll probably be more familiar, but on this particular one, this is Peck. <laughs> And then the front of the school is 14th and 15th that, that come in and do the up there. So we're reconfiguring all the parking and drop-off to eliminate the crowding in the neighborhoods at the crucial points. 
proposing to. Yeah, this is done. More specifically, that site is actually between Beck Pool and Meadows Elementary. It's kind of in the crust of the hill that you would see between those two facilities. So on this side, there's homes here on 14th Street, and then there's and then you have Manhattan Beach Boulevard. So Manhattan Beach Boulevard is about a block out from to the south of this picture. Okay. Okay, Grandview Ladera site, um, if everybody's oriented, you're going to help me with all of the street names because I don't remember them for every campus. It's simple, it's north or, or south, pardon me, of Sand Dunes. So, yeah. this is Vista, 24th Street, and Bell is the one that's on an angle. And again, I don't want to get in to explain each one of these as a 10 minute conversation in and of themselves. So, okay. Yeah, okay, so my intent was to go through these quickly just to show that each one of these sites have a proposed master plan that falls into it. And then as we get to the end, we come to the Manhattan Beach Middle School master plan. So what I wanted to go through today is we did four iterations of this plan with various different activities and groups. And it's not until we got to the final one, we finally got to sit down with Polywalk Park friends of one-on-one -on -one to really understand all the concerns. So a little bit of what I did going into this, because I wanted to really understand, is when the district purchased the land in 1957, there was an elementary school there that was operating for 20 years until it closed in 1980. And um, 1972, it took that long for the district and the city to come to grips with the transfer of the lease so they can develop Hollywood Park. And then the park was dedicated in 76, so they built it over a four or five year period. And then the school opened at the middle school and they tore down the elementary school and built the middle school in that area in 1998. And it has only really received relocatables since it opened, nine of them I believe. So the first plan, which was a very naive approach from my point of view, being as the architect, was saying, okay, where is the best area to build? And uh, flat area is the best area to build. So we said, okay, if we're gonna in increase the capacity of the school or get rid of the relos and actually get their programs up and running for a 1,500 student school instead of 1,100, we proposed that. And then there was talks with the community and the city over the years about Bay Pool being in desperate need of replacement. And part of the school's plans was they didn't like all the students walking all the way across Hollywood Park to utilize the pool as part of the PE program. So, so, oh, great solution. Let's just put it closer to the campus, right? Um, as we all know, that did not go over too well. And it just says that even as an architect in planning, we all learn as we go through this. So the next step, we said, okay, let's not really touch too much of Pollywog Park with our understanding of being the pond and everything else. So if we had to do something with the play field area, let's move the new building back up into the play field area so it's not affecting the park. Let's put the pool in the far corner so it's as far away from any homes as possible. Yeah. And then expand the play field areas accordingly so that this, the Manhattan Beach Middle School still had the same amount of play fields. Well, that's neglecting looking at what that actually still did to the park. And then we had the 18th Street meeting. Which they said, we don't want a building backing up against our houses. So we went through that one, and that was a night, very, very informative meeting as we went through as well. So the next step was saying, okay, let's respect the green space at the north to separate the neighborhood from the park and the school. And we still had to deal with how do we, how do we increase, because their, their current multi-purpose room holds a fraction of the student population, and ideally with the way education is taught and the way the popularity of their band and choral programs that building was one of their number one priorities. They really needed a multi-purpose space that could seat half the school population, <laughs> which is what the original one was trying to do. When you say that building, can you just, just help me here? This one. You don't have a laser light, I think. No, I had one, but the batteries are dead, so I can't do anything about it. Kevin, do you think that we could go through in about two minutes or so? I'm almost done. Okay, perfect. Just yeah. I want to make sure that everyone's questions are answered. Okay. I can't figure out a question if I don't know what is 
And we'll go back to the plans when you have questions as well. You want to go through? So this still reconfigured the play areas because in my mind I thought, oh, it's great we can put an extra play field, thinking that was a benefit. And then, you know, what we finally sat down with the friends of Polywalk Park, understood the issues and the importance of really not touching the habitat park, keeping the maturity there. This was the final plan that we came up with when we were talking. And it downsized the C building there to 2,300 square, 23,000 square feet, which is, it's basically a 750 student multi-purpose room with a stage attached and then a music, build, music program attached to that. And then the only building in the park that would be proposed, this is a proposed, this isn't even part of the proper master plan, is to rebuild Big Pool in the parking lot of the existing Big Pool, and then rebuild the dog park and the connection up to the new parking areas, and then make sure anything we do with paving is pervious so it all absorbs the water and helps with the runoff. And this we all came to a conclusion that was talking with the friends of Colorado Park. So this tries to very tread lightly on the park. This one's still me. <laughs> okay, when we went through and did all of the costing associated with this, this is the, what are, what are the parameters? The parameters are, I'll show you two slides, $50 million if we do nothing but maintain the buildings over the next 15 to 20 years, or if everything was done, the wish list in the world, it costs $319 million. So that's not saying that that's what the master plan is. That's just saying this is what it costs after this exercise to define what they were. And then here is the facility assessment just to keep the buildings maintained in their current state would run $50 million at the same time frame that a building program for $319 million would go. So there's no cost on this. These were just looking at from zero to whatever. We wanted to know what the whatever was. Now I think we're I know you guys are eager to, to ask questions and to, to, really, to drill down more on Polywa specifically. It's the purpose of this slide is really just, you know, there, there have been bonds in the city already, you know, in, for the school district already. Most recently, we, we just finished up this year, Measure BB. Um, I, I think this is pretty self-explanatory, but we have, um, we, we feel very good about the, the bond that we just completed, Measure BB, which was focused on the high school, um, the math science building, the renovation of classrooms, the addition of a performing art space and then a small theater and the student club and the cafeteria attics, as well as um, two that occurred earlier. Um, very quickly, Measure A basically you know, built the middle school and did a modernization to all five elementary schools, including the reopening of Robinson. Um, Measure M was also at Mary Crystal High School and, and also included the, the district office. And um, enough about that. And then, really, the, you know, the purpose of the slide is um, there, there is you know, an amount of bonding that is allowable through formulas in the city. The, you know, the dollar amount is total that, uh, that Kevin just shared exceeds that. Um, we are realistic that that's you know, unlikely that that's going to happen. It's just information. Um, what also is on here as well is that there are, you know, there are potential state funds that can come to bear. Uh, there are components of the project that we may look toward private fundraising, um, specifically the athletic complex at the high school. And you know, particularly when it comes to Polyhog Park, there's a you know, possibility that the, the city will participate. So um, there's lots of different ways this may happen. Um, but again, it, it, none of it will happen until we go out and have many more meetings like this and decide what the priorities of the community are and where we intersect in terms of you know, dollar amounts and what actually is proposed to do, which will be a multi-year process. Um, and none of this is happening tomorrow or even and with that, uh, I thank you very much, and we will see you next Thank you. Thanks. All right. So, you're going to have to jump up to the mic at any rate. Uh, okay. All right, so we're going to begin the question and answer session. I do have some questions that were phoned in and emailed in to the Residents Association. I can begin with a few of those as the rest of you formulate. If any of you are, for any reason, uncomfortable or uh, unable to, uh, to, uh, to uh, 
sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Unable to speak. <laughs> if any of you would prefer that, that I read your question for you, feel free to write it down. Some of you already have. You can pass it to Erin, uh, who's there in the black, um, and she'll be happy to gather those questions and I'll read them for you. Um, is there anyone who has a burning question that would like to ask it first? Yes, go ahead. I'll repeat. This, uh, this is a facilities master plan, is that correct? Correct. How often are these done? When was the last one done? Stephanie, need a microphone. Repeat the question. Uh, the question is, um, this is a facilities master plan, and when was the last one done? And, uh, you know, I've been in this district, you know, as a parent since 2000 and on the school board for six years, and this is the you know, first of its, of its nature that we that, that I've witnessed. No, they did that in 95, in the 90s, to go out to the first time. It was a, a study of all the facilities and money attached to it, which was a lot more than the amount we went out in bonds. So it was back in that time. I don't know what it's meant right now. Yeah. The response from the audience was that, there, that this facilities planning process was done in 90 prior to the previous fall. Is the small type on this chart a sequence of what will be done in what order? The type that cannot be? Oh, this type here? Yes. It does not represent a sequence. It's simply alphabetical at this point because there's no prioritization. In the back, Carolyn. Um, you mentioned that should we proceed with the plan, um, and the cost would be three hundred and did you say nineteen thousand million dollars, as opposed to the fifty fifty one million or whatever to maintain the buildings? Does that mean if you proceed with the three hundred and nineteen million, does that erase the maintenance of the existing building, or is that absorbed into the three hundred and nineteen million? Yeah. Uh, the question I believe was if we if they want to head with the facility master plan with the 319 million would the 50 million be erased from that and the answer is in a sliding format depending on the time frames and there is a there's three categories I believe to the facility assessment that arrived at 50 million the first one is 2.9 million dollars in immediate needs meaning things that should be done rather quickly within the next few years but the rest of it would definitely be offset dramatically by the, the facility master plan next question um let's see one one thing i'm i'm personally very interested in is seeing um access to a, a bigger pool, but I haven't known about that plan for um, El Segundo Weisberg. Uh, can you tell us where that's located, when it's supposed to be built, and whether it will be publicly available? I don't know all those answers. I can only tell you where it will be on Nash, just north of El Segundo Boulevard, so about two, mile, two and a half miles from Hollywood. The rest, I'm not sure. I know they're building, they're constructing, maybe I don't know something about it. Do you know what the construction is? Oh, okay. Because if the high school is doing some building already there, and this will be next. I'm not sure what that is. That doesn't all the fire. Kevin, if you can speak to that, about use. Oh, outside. Yeah. State it's law, does it be fire? Right. Oh, if it's not being used, then it needs to be available to other people, like you were saying. Donald question. <laughs> it's not a school. It's not a school facility. Yeah, I don't know. No. Okay. Bottom line, we don't really know all that. <laughs> Sorry. Here's a question here. The slide said the slide. The slide. Wait a minute. The slide that was presented showed that the pool was part of the Wiseburn. Right. School. So is it or is it not? It's, it's a combination, I think, El Segundo City and Weisburn are both paying. I know El Segundo can put 10 million into it, and I, that's all is I it, Is it school land truly or is it city land? <laughs> <laughs> I think they bought it over the city. Somebody said they were giving it from Arthur. I'm not sure. I'm just, I can't go there. <laughs> <laughs> it's El Segundo. So can you remember the answer? My question is, please. 
what is the stadium seating used for and why do we need it? Are we going to rent out the outsiders? Or is this going to be for the community? Or why do we need this 750 stadium seating? Oh, right. for Yes, yes. Um, I think what you're referring to is the um, performing arts education space at the Moe School, which is the building that Kevin pointed out in a few different locations. And um, that is classrooms for band, choir, orchestra, and a multi purpose room, which means you know, a big flat room, perhaps with a raised area at one end of it, but something that makes it more flexible than, you know, you know say, tiered, you know, auditorium style seating, much like the auditorium at the high school. So it's, it's intended for maximum flexibility for when there is a school event, and also for dividers and classrooms and things for band, choir, orchestra. Thank you. I have a question related to that. Can I have the mic? Thank you. You know, on the previous slides that you showed us, Mira Costa has 2,500 students, and their theater seats 300 students. We, we have at middle school 1,500 students, and you want to build the 750, twice the size of Mira Costa. The other question I have, and you'll answer that because I don't want to take the mic the second time, uh, we're going to be subjected to a bond, which is not for classroom as we were subjected when the school was built, the middle school. This is for recreational facilities and scenery services pools. And it's going to be a cost on the residents of the community. And if it was for classroom, I would understand. But this is for like luxury, recreational, and ancillary. And you know, it's um, the, the citizens are, are concerned. This is not okay. Good question. Mm -hmm. okay, uh, the, the first question that was uh, comparing the Miracosta to the middle school, and I'll just clarify that. The, uh, there is an auditorium at, at uh, Miracosta, and you're right, it is a, a larger population campus. Um, that auditorium seats 1,500. Yeah, there's an existing auditorium at Miracosta that seats 1,500. What we added was a 300 seat um, theater, um, again, teaching space, a flat room that has retractable seating for smaller performances and, again, provide an open space when needed. So it has, it already has a much larger uh, theater. So that was the easy question. Okay. <laughs> the, um, Allow her to answer your, yeah. your question. And then I believe your, your second question was just the, the nature of what we're proposing and specific to the middle school sort of being luxury when you mean the pool when you say that. Um, well, first of all, there, most of it is you know, classroom and education space, but what's happening at the middle school. Um, Polywalk is a, re a replacement of, of the pool, and so that, that may be questionable. And that, again, that will be for the community to determine if it's something they will bear in a bond situation. There is a polling that typically happens to determine um, where the community's interests lay. The line. And um, so that remains to be seen. Um, the existing pool is is deemed you know, not adequate for its uses, both for the school and for its current community uses of swimming and, and whatnot. But that remains to be seen. Mm -hmm. uh, in the current plan, uh, is there additional parking planned, and where is it going to be? And how will it affect the habitat? Yeah, currently right now there is proposed additional parking, even though I want everybody to keep in mind the school is not increasing its capacity. And you know, from what it's currently authorized to do. And most of the parking that we're trying to propose is we're we're limiting access on the 18th Street side by Premier Field that currently now impacts that whole neighborhood to the north for drop off and pick up. And we're suggesting and trying to put the additional parking where it says B up there, which currently they have, I think somewhere around 100 nondescript parking spaces that are hard to find and hard to get to. And we're putting 250 parking spaces up there that can utilize for weekend parking and everything for the park, and also be utilized for pick up and drop off because the students walking from the middle school to there is not that much farther than walking up into the agency neighborhood. And then they can get directly back on that at the age of the park. 
People don't park there, they park on 18th and back. I have two follow-up questions that were handed to me regarding parking, so I'll just read them out. They've already been answered or not, and we can address them. So the first is, where is the parking, followed by what standards are used for parking requirements? The next person wrote, is it true that the plan allows for fewer parking spaces than the park currently has, despite the proposed attractions that would create a demand for parking? Is studying parking not a required part of your process? Doesn't the city have a say in that? By that I, I assume that they're referring to the Parking and Public Improvements Commission, if they would have a say. So, yes, there is additional parking with the plan. Just, I think that covered a lot of the questions on here. Uh, there is a process that you have to go through a part of the environmental re regulations, the CEQA. Now, there's different categories of how school districts deal with CEQA, but there would have to be a, a environmental impact study that's done, or, or at least uh, updated from the one that was done from middle school originally, and put up a public comment that would determine that, that restriction on the parking area. Now, when it comes to sizing parking, <clears throat> when you're in a, in a situation like a middle school where if you were building this school brand new on the suburbs, the Department of Ed would want 20 acres for it and we have seven for play field and everything else. So you're never gonna get to the optimum, shall we say, but this doubles the amount of parking that is currently available for that area in the middle school. So I think we're getting closer to the reality. I don't think we could ever over park it, shall we say, we're doing the best we can. Yeah, hi, uh, I have a kind of a two focus, two prong question. First one has to do with these proposed uh, new amenities, the PAC, the pool, and the kitchens, which may or may not be catered to. Now, is it not true that per the education code for the state of California, that when not in use for school purposes, the school, the school district is required by law to make these available to any and everybody for outside use? That's my first question. I, I understand that to be part of the education code. So I just want people to understand that these things are not going to be part of the education code. These things are not just going to be used for school purposes. The next question has to do with parking. And as I've discussed with you before, Kevin, that was 200 and, was it 250 parking spaces there? Well, I'm really well versed with torrential parking patterns, particularly because so much of it occurs right in front of my house. <laughs> okay, and what I can tell you is that Manhattan Beach parents do not like to wait. So this parking might be great for events where they're going to be parked for a while, but as far as parking itself goes, as far as pickup and drop off goes, unless, and I said this before, unless you have points of direct, direct points of ingress and egress, both of them, and you have traffic flow patterns established, what will de facto happen here is they'll eschew the parking lot because they don't want to wait. They don't want to be caught behind somebody, and they'll just all park on 12th Street. So I want to warn people who live on 12th Street about that. That's why I personally suggested to you that rather than having catering kitchens or kitchens of any sort, since they already do seem to be just fine where they are, as far as child safety, please let me say that this is a, they have allowed the situational language for 15 years at the end of uh, at the end of Heron Avenue, using that as a de facto pickup and drop off point, that's already resulted in a serious accident. That's language for that the school board, that the, excuse me, the city was sued about when one of the parents hit one of the children, December 2010. So what I see is this this catering kitchen area, or now Sanford and Sons um, <laughs> maintenance yards. This has direct ingress and egress to Manhattan Beach Boulevard and Peck, and I see this as being a much more effective drop-off space given the actual utilization of, quote, pick-up and drop-off parking. I'm going to let Kevin answer the outside use question, but I'll, I'll try and address the other two topics that I took out as parking and catering You want to do that now? Okay. Um, I don't have all the details because I would need to 
quote, education code to you, but there's uh, something called the Civic Center Act, which governs the use of school facilities by outside organizations. Um, it, the, most of the language is permissive and not required language, um, and it, it really is governed by policies set by the board. So the board defines when those facilities are to be made available, um, and certainly all of this, all of our facilities are primarily for the use of schools, school programs, and school-related organizations. Um, and then there, the, the act provides regulations regarding um, uh, allowing use for um, nonprofit organizations and other community groups, and defines schools as civic centers, as places where civic groups may need to congregate in order to meet. Um, but the, that use is defined as secondary to school use. Well, yes, yeah, secondary to school use. And I just took over a you know, quick glance at the act today myself. I think I come away with a slightly different, different interpretation to the domestic which I'm going to reread it. But um, that, that's definitely something that the community really should look into is how much the, uh, you know, the, these facilities would be used outside of school funds by uh, other agencies. You know, we provide lunches at uh, all of our school sites, and the kitchen at the middle school is our district location for um, the food that is sent out to the elementary schools. And they have what are called serving kitchens, which are basically warming and serving, you know, not a lot of preparation. Um, so, and as the middle school itself has grown and our elementary schools have grown, the capacity of that has become more challenging. And in addition to the fact that trucks are coming on and off the campus to get the food to take it out to the other site. So what we are proposing or considering in this uh, early designs is that the existing maintenance operation yard that Stephanie mentioned that's at the corner of the Tech and uh, Manhattan Beach Boulevard, would, we would move a common kitchen there that is just for the purposes of the district. It is not a catering kitchen. And um, as well as uh, revamping of the maintenance of the yard itself, which hasn't been touched since the in the 50s. Um, so in terms of parking, um, I'm not exactly sure there was a question in there. Um, you did comment on parking habits of, of parents and the ingress and egress. And this has been designed with the intent of you know, working to improve parking. And that was our intent. First thing is, I don't trust the school board. <laughs> Can the present school board be trusted to handle the master facility plan? 328 million. That's five times the amount for Maricosta High School of 67 million. I want a survey that shows at least 55% of the residents approve the plan. An oversight committee that makes sure the projects are on time and within budget. The $67 million Maricosta High School re renovation, a survey to approve the ballot measure was not made available until the day before the election. When we asked Dr. Romaine to release the survey, he stated that residents can't see it. It's our survey paid with our money. The school board reaction and survey itself look very suspicious. The school board should, have, should be very reluctant to have an oversight committee. I was the only one that went out of 35,000 people, I went to the school board and I said, why don't you have an oversight committee? I remembered Superintendent Gerald Davis and Mary Rogers had been indicted for misappropriation of school funds. And they said, well, you know, that's the old school. We're the new school. Well, anyway, finally they had 15, 15 uh, oversight committee. Let me say one more thing. Mr. Bush, let me, let me allow them to respond to your questions. Okay, very good. Thank you. Thank Uh, thank you. Uh, so, the 
the question about a, a survey, the you know, when a bond effort is, is pursued, there is a polling process that happens, and that is to work to understand the intersection of interest and you know, tolerance on a financial level for what is proposed to happen in the district. So we can look at all of the different things that are proposed and you know, the community can weigh in on what interests them. And for example, when we did Measure BB uh, back in uh, 2008, at that point there was, even though there, there's many people who felt that there was need for an improved athletic facility, there was, it was something that did not pull well in the process, and so it was not part of that plan. That's just, you know, one small example of where the community speaks for what is it, it is interested in supporting the bond. So, and I, and, and really the ultimate survey is the passing of a bond overall, which happens to have a 35% It's a requirement. They cannot do anything without it. Who selects that? Yeah. 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 The school board. Oh, oh, oh. Right. The school board approves yeah, but it. That's not fair. That's not Allow them to finish answering question. The school board. The school board approves the committee, but the selection of that committee, it's it's community driven. You can be on the committee. Everybody can apply for it. <laughs> <laughs> that's why if you've got multiple people who want to be a part of it, who selects those individuals? I need to address a couple of questions that were that were handed to me. So like, like, does, does, anyone, does anyone know how much parkland Manhattan Beach has in comparison with nearby cities in places of a similar size and demographics? I've been told we're deficient in park space and the proposal only makes it worse. Well, we've been told we're deficient many times, but I don't know the specifics compared to other cities. Um, I just have heard that a lot, that we are deficient. A lot of Los Angeles is. A couple of teams, like teams, but like kids, second grade on up, swimming their day and night. I mean, it is programmed all the time. So it's, if this, I'm speaking out of turn, but this is seen as a community, not just as a middle school. Did you have one in the sixth grade? Pardon me? Did you have one in the sixth grade? Yeah, actually, I did. In the high school? Yeah. What do you mean? I didn't live by the beach, but I had three, there were three schools in my town. I mean, I don't know. Yeah. So they had Maragosta. And also, Maragosta had a cafeteria where they used that as the all purpose room. On the stage, at the cafeteria, plenty of room. I just we get some questions in the back. Um, I'll, I'll go loud because I can. <laughs> and once the mic is back on, then other quieter people can go. Uh, my name is Barry. I live next door to the park. I walk my dog there. I've got a daughter in middle school and a daughter in high school. I've been here since 1999. I probably walked through that park several thousand times. It is a ball. It is so necessary that we have trees and yes. green space. Mm -hmm. I was there just the other night, I saw a middle-aged couple just sitting on the hill under a tree eating and take out dinner. I see people playing soccer into the wee hours, the, the late into the hours, just, just guys kicking ball around, a ball around. I see people walking their dogs. I'm one of them, the dog park. Uh, I'm from a small town in Upper Michigan, 25,000 people, where there's 
hours of forest everywhere. But this feels like that because Manhattan Beach is a small town. I don't live in LA, I live in Europe. I live in Manhattan Beach. And when I heard that there were plans to maybe take down trees, I was appalled. When I heard there were plans to put up big buildings, I was horrified. Now I'm relatively new to all this, so pardon me if I've covered ground that other people have covered before. Um, I have to say I like the looks of that latest plan better. It leaves the trees in place. I don't like losing the dog in the park, but it leaves the trees in place. And I'll just, uh, I want to applaud everybody for having a cooperative spirit towards dealing with this. But I think everybody is here today because of trees, of grass, of a place to just walk and just be. There's not a question, but I'll just finish up. I do think Beg Pool does need upgrading. I'll agree with that. Because I walk my dog at quarter to six in the morning, and there's a swing team up there. Those people are crazy. <laughs> That's probably the only time they can get it. So, some of these upgrades I think are worthwhile, but the trees. <laughs>
and they'd rent it out till 10 o'clock at night. And all the people that live around here, let around me allow, uh, allow them to respond to that. Do you have a response to that call? Well, as you said, it was a statement, not a question. Um, this, I will share that the, uh, the district and the city are in their third year of a, of a shared use agreement, and that the, when we are not using our school facilities, the city does use them for you know, everything from Little League to Manhattan Beach Youth Basketball, you know, swim leagues, et cetera. Um, so that, that, that does occur. I'm, again, there really wasn't a question there, but we do have a uh, shared use agreement with the city. It does provide vital funds for the schools and provides vital facilities for the community. So any of the facility can have a shared use with the city? It is a shared use Yeah, well that's not nice. <laughs> I, I want to say I'm in support of the school board. I have two kids that went through elementary school, middle school, and high school here. And the school, schools in Manhattan Beach, I think we all got to recognize that we're benefiting. Our homes are going way up in value because of the school board and, and the work that these people are doing. And, and there will be some increase in taxes. What are talking here? But, but think about what your home is going up to. And whoever had the question if seniors can be exempt from the bond, I think that's a great question. If you go on fixed income, if there's a legal way to do that, I think that's a beautiful thing. But I like what you're doing here. My one question is the people that live next to these facilities, if you're adding more space, you need to add more parking for them. And Hollywood, we may not even be the school district that's really impacting the residents. It's probably the concerts in the park or the city functions. But, but the people who live next to the park, they need some additional parking added. And I think the school board should focus on that. But again, you guys are doing a great job. Thank you. There are thank you. Thank you. Um, it, in the case of, of parcel taxes, which are another way that schools can fund themselves, there is an opportunity for seniors to opt out. I honestly don't know the answer in the case of bonds, and that's, that's something we can find out about. Um, you're absolutely right about the Thank you. I've been a resident here in Manhattan Beach since 1986. I've enjoyed every minute of it. Hollywood Park has been a delight myself and my family. I love the concerts in the park, and uh, it's, uh, it's been a real pleasure to live in Manhattan Beach. I read a uh, treatise uh, uh, today that uh, said that for the bond issue, uh, the taxes, uh, uh, property taxes, would increase to uh, between 11 and 14 percent. I think that that's a, a, a pretty big increase for uh, doing something that I really don't understand what's going on. Why we need a bigger pool? Why do we need a performing arts center when uh, uh, the Dondo Beach uh, performing arts center is really not doing that well? And performing arts centers aren't doing that well. So I, I really don't understand the basis for uh, the, uh, uh, the bond issue. Uh, I'd really like to see a breakdown breakdown for every element on every campus, the campus total. And just so everybody's aware, like the Hollywood Park component is a very, very small component to this major effort. And most of it, it has everything to do with updating the educational facilities at the elementary schools, which is the biggest need in this master plan. The pool was simply there to basically, it, it's a problem for the middle school and it's been a problem for the community. So it was a good faith effort to say if we're going to do something about the pool, we're going to do it together. So that's, and it's not even, it's only, the cost is only half, we only counted it at half because they wouldn't do it without a partner. So it's it's far off. 
When it comes to the bonding, it's a complicated formula for how you assess value homes in Manhattan Beach, but you're, you're limited to a 2% of your assessed value. And my understanding doing the calculations is without the current bond, because you have a current bond you're paying off in the high school, which will get less and less and less and less over the years as you go down, this will not be implemented all at once. And the 319 is a cap. What the district will do with the community is decide where does the community want to support this. It could be 100 million, it could be 20 million, it could be 200 million. Nobody knows yet. So that would come in against the other bond going down. So there's not a 15% or a 14% increase. I don't think that would be mathematically possible on the assessed value, but we don't know what that's going to be until we know what it actually is going to look like, how, the, how they're going to implement the plan, if it's going to be implemented at all. Um, my husband's a principal at Hawthorne High School, and their facilities, the shared facilities, public, public um, fields and courts are used 24-7. They're, they're never not used. So I can see the same thing happening with all these facilities at the middle school. My question to you is, would you want to live across the street from this? I would love to live across the street. I can't come on the 24 by 7. City, but you know the city and the school district, the school district are very interested in the welfare of the community. Welfare of the community, and I don't see that we would have activities in that long. But it would be used by the community. I'm not even really sure that that, just like our facilities already are, it is an asset for the community. Right here. For the facilities that are there, I would assume that there has to be some type of a hard number that says you have such a residential density, you have a park, you have an Olympic pool, you have a, pre or a preschool that's located, with the density we have at the park. There has to be some kind of a hard number that says for the density of the residents and the activities that take place in this half a square mile area, there has to be a required parking number. This room, there's an occupancy number right on the wall. I can't believe that we can put in this facility and have no idea what the required safe parking quantity is. And if it's a large number and we have to put in a lot, how can we plan anything else until we know how much parking we have to provide? Uh, it's always a good question, but the school districts do not follow city planning ordinances. They are exempt from them. They follow the state, the state of California when it comes to the planning number. Now, when you plan for a school, you do a hard count for what's required for staff, and then you do a guest parking ratio. Now, high school, I don't want to get into that because you have student drivers, you have a whole different issue, and we're not really dealing with parking there, but the 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 130 parking spaces that are associated with the school more than account for the faculty and, and the and the parking required to run the middle school. The problems occur with the drop-off and pickup, which is not a parking problem, it's a drop-off and pickup problem. So they're two separate issues. But to count it, like for the park, the city could say, hey, we don't want to do anything to the park unless we can provide this money parking spaces. But that's, the, the, the city is the purveyor of the park. The district owns the land. The city built the park. So anything that we're trying to do on school district <coughs> property that would help alleviate the parking with the park is what the goal was. To come up with a number to park the park, I don't, I, I don't even know where you would begin to come up with a number because you'd have to plan for the, the largest event that could possibly be held there, one of the concerts. And you would never be able to park the concert in, in a parking lot on the park. So then it's, then it's not adding the parking. If we have people showing up to go to an event and 
there's no place for them to park, then I think, to go. I think that was the intent with the revised plan to make sure that no facility is being designed that is increasing the current activity of the park. That was the whole driving force, but still add more parking than is currently exists to help alleviate the problem that currently exists. If they're going to build the mall, and they're going to expand the mall. There's some number that says you must provide. They don't know what day people are going to go shopping. They don't know when they're going to show up. They don't know if they're all going to come at once. But they provide. I guarantee you in that plan it says a thousand parking places. They, they, they do have a plan when you have an occupancy count in a physical facility, but for a park facility, there is not a formula that drives a parking number because you don't know what the use of the park is. And the 750 seat park park does not enter into that? Well, it's, I, I want to make clear, this is a multi-purpose room. It is not a performing arts center. It's a large multi-purpose room that has retractable seating, but it's, it's, a, it's the same purpose of an existing multi-purpose room, except they needed to accommodate more than 400 students. They needed to accommodate half of their current student population for teaching, events, lectures, and their theater program. So it's a multi-purpose room. It's not intended to be a theater like the Redondo Beach Theater, that would be a tiered seat, rentable, fly tower, performance space. It is a middle school multi-purpose room, just like they have now with a stage attached. Only, only intended for the use of students, not parents. Well, I'm sure parents will come to events that are performances there. Where do they park? Well, currently they have events at the school district, and my understanding is they expand the play field area. They park in the back. In the back area, the whole laptop yeah. area and That's tennis courts and everything is all. But the point, building. the point being is they're not including, they're not increasing the population of the school, or the parents that own the children that go to that school. So we're not assuming that it's going to be well, own. Excuse me, my, my phrase. The parents of the children that go to the school. So I don't think we're increasing the current problem. We're trying to alleviate it with adding more parking on the other side. Because we're about to have the lights turned out on us again, uh, we're going to accommodate one more question, and then after that I'm going to give each of our speakers, Ms. Rosenberg, Ms. Prophet, a couple of minutes to speak to you about how to continue this conversation with each of them. Uh, and then uh, I will have just a few housekeeping things. I do, at this time, want to say that I'm very sorry that some of you had to stand, um, and hopefully next time we'll be able to accommodate more seats in here. But we'll take one last question from the back. I, I just put my hand up. So I don't know what I did wrong. But. <laughs> so I'm going to do a couple of things. I'm going to agree with the gentleman to my right who said that the school board has been doing a great job because Manhattan Beach does have excellent schools. So as far as the skills needed to, to deliver a great education to our children, you've been doing that. I would like to question, though, do you have the skills on the board to evaluate a facility's master plan? Those are different skills um, than what you have on the board now. And, and so that's, that's one question. And if you don't have the skills, do you know what skills you need to bring into an advisory committee? to help you to make sure that whatever happens, whatever version of this happens, it doesn't misstep. That's, and I think that addresses a lot of the issues that you've heard, I've just turned it into a question, and it's an important one. Uh, things like, there is a 10% contingency, I think, in this $319 million, but I haven't the vaguest idea of how you came up with that number. I mean, I used to run multi-million dollar projects, and I know how I estimated contingency based on a bunch of stuff, and I don't know how, whether it was a plug number or based on, who knows. So I, I, those are the kinds of skills I mean, and it's something to think about. So are they there, and do you know what skills you need? The second question is, is for Kevin. Um, and Kevin, I'm a little dismayed that you had that many iterations of a master plan. I mean, it was like one a month. Um, and I can't imagine that it was an efficient way to go. So my question is, 
how come <laughs> there were so many iterations, and how come in none except that last iteration did DLR ever think about the significant environmental impact that Julie presented at the top end of this? That's huge. The storm drainage, the habitat, the, you know, all of those other things. And you said it wasn't until that last version that you even thought about the environmental impact. That, and, and maybe there's a good reason for it, I don't know, but that, that disturbs me that it didn't come to Yeah. Thank you, Elise. First of all, thank you for saying you have confidence in the board. I appreciate that. And then following it up with hard questions. Uh, the, <laughs> the, uh, the, uh, the board has just, I mean, we just completed Measure BB, where we brought many different skill sets beyond the board to bear and ended the project successfully. So I, I, my answer to your question is, but does the board have the skill set? Every single one? No, but we will bring the right resources to bear as we just did with uh, Measure BB from bond expertise to oversight to construction to design, etc. Um, and I'm happy to say that you know, we, we've just gone through this since you know, 2008 to the present and um, are ready to do that again. Um, and then I guess it went, then went to Kevin's question. <laughs> my inability to get it right the first time. Which I, you know, I don't know how to answer because part of my job is to listen. And sometimes you don't always hear what somebody is telling you until we finally sat down with Stephanie and Julie one-to-one. -one. It wasn't at a board meeting or at some kind of statement driven or responding to a, you know, a, an article in the newspaper. It was sitting down and quite frankly, it was me going there on a weekend and sitting in the park and having lunch. It was part of it too. Because I'm trying to master plan the middle school who happens to be on the Polywog Park, and it takes some time to make sure that you're looking at everything equally from all sides. And I just thank the Friends of Polywog Park for outlining all the important things in the park, and I think we all came to a better agreement, understanding, and realization about the beauty and the importance of the park. So, yes, it may have taken longer to get there than some other people, but we got there. And that's actually the important side. And that was only that was the one that we had the most iterations. Most of the other ones went far, far more smoothly. Would you like to tell the audience how they can continue this conversation? Yes. Uh, thank you all for coming tonight. Um, it's been great hearing all of your opinions of the park, your love for the park, and I'm glad we share that. Um, We've been around for about a year. We formed our neighborhood just when we found out there was a skate park, skate park being planned for Polywalk. So a few of our neighbors exchanged emails and said, let's come up with a name, Friends of Polywalk. <laughs> and uh, we have periodic meetings. Whenever something comes up, we email everybody to get the word out and uh, decide how to go about helping fix it. We go to council meetings. We keep our eye on things. Uh, so, our website is mbpop.org. It stands for Manhattan Beach Friends of Polywalk Park.org. So if you want to come and join our website, join our group, just um, just come give us your email address that way, and you'll be a member. It's free. Thanks so much. Thank you. Um, I so admire FOPP, particularly that you're you know, a one-year-old in that, because some of the, one of the most organized and effective groups that, I, that I've seen, and really does a lot of good for the city. So thank you so much for everyone who worked to form that. And um, I, what I want to point out is, we too really would love to gather your information. And I was encouraging people to do that as they came in, they kind of gave me a sideways look. Um, we have parent data, you know, electronic ways to communicate with parents. We do not have it for non-parents, and the city is very gracious and will give us mailing labels, but um, we really try not to do hard copy mailings for cost and for environmental reasons. So if you, you know, if you want to hear more about this, if you keep, you want to be continue this dialogue, please, um, it's not very fancy, it's a yellow pad in the back, but please um, share your email 
um, information, and because we would love to be, or, or a phone number if you're not not into email, um, and we would love to to be able to keep sharing information with you and seek information from you. So it's it's um, I hope that you're willing to do that now, and um, you can also always go to mbusd.org to communicate with the board, to communicate with the administration, and. Um, I want to thank our MBUDA president, Sean Chen, who's in the back of the room, for always being so involved. Um, because this really is about teachers in addition to students, because that what is what creates the machine, the energy, the, the, the brilliance that uh, allows our students to excel. So thank you, Sean, for being here. Thank you all for being here. Thank you. Thank you all for coming tonight. I do want to say if any of you are interested in supporting the continued efforts of the Manhattan Beach Residents Association, you can visit Manhattan Beach Residents Association.org. Right. All spelled out. Thank you so much for your support tonight. Well, how do you